For at TV, the world is thinking. You spent a lot of time this evening talking about the decisions that presidents make bringing the country into war. We've seen a number of occasions where wars have gone badly. Vietnam and Iraq are two that you've discussed this evening. I wonder if you'd comment on why you think it is so difficult for presidents to make decisions to change their policies when wars go badly. Why they insist upon staying the course, using as examples Lyndon Johnson and George W. Bush, who seem like very different people in many respects, and yet seem to have committed the same kind of um, strategic mistakes and seem to be very deeply invested in wars that appear to be unwinnable. I, I think there's a very simple answer to that. Um, George, John no doubt has a more sophisticated answer, but. Uh, for my part, the answer can be found in two simple words, in vain. That no president wants to admit that he's shed blood, lost lives, destroyed national treasure, in vain. So the, it's kind of like an investment sunk fund theory, you know, throwing good money after bad. Once you've committed, it's political suicide to admit that the original decision was a mistake. And they've given less than honest reasons for going into the war. The war starts to go badly, and they think, my God, I have to come out with an outcome here that pertains to or corresponds with the reasons I gave. And so usually they stick with this because they're convinced it's going to obtain those, those objectives. Then when they don't finally, in the case of Vietnam or other failed wars, then they, they, then they make up falsehoods about the end of the war. And that really did satisfy the falsehoods that they told going into the war. It's really, it's, they're trapped mentally. And also, Alexander de Conde has written a, a recent book about uh, presidential machismo. And he just shows case after case after case of the most mild-mannered men just getting into the office and becoming uh, warriors. Uh, and, and, and whether it's a major war or minor interventions, they're all ready to do that. And it's manly, and it's the thing that, that drives them. Uh, Truman has great quotes about uh, the lust for war that he felt uh, in the presidency. It's one of the reasons that Hillary Clinton has such trouble uh, in this campaign trying to prove her, her false or fake or faux masculinity, because she has to, because all presidents come into the office with that going for them. Nothing makes the blood pound in a society more than going to war. I mean, uh, you get the patriotic songs and the flags flying and people wanting to be on board, mm -hmm. and especially after the country's been attacked, which, uh, which is the, the greatest advantage the president had in making this decision. Uh, other questions? Or for that matter, if there are any answers in the room, I'd be happy to, <laughs> I'd be happy to hear those. You know, I might, I might just share a further anecdote with you. Um, that, that also stemmed from my time with this ROTC encampment uh, last summer. Um, the, the senior general whose guest I was, a Brigadier General by name uh, Doyle Broom, at one point uh, when I was there said something very, very poignant. He said, you know, since uh, 2003, he said, the Army has been at war, but the country has not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And again, it, it encapsulates uh, what I was trying to say earlier. But it also points to something I think potentially quite dangerous. Um, I don't think we're at a flashpoint in this particular uh, area yet, but it's something to think about. But the military increases the separate institution from the rest of the society. If you see modern military bases, uh, they have college dormitory level uh, accommodations, they have shopping centers, they have movie theaters, bowling alleys, and so on. People never need to leave the base. And in fact, there was a controversy at Fort Lewis, coincidentally the same place uh, last spring, where the commandant of the, of the fort, of the, of the camp, uh, temporarily decreed that there would be no more funeral services for uh, people who trained there coming back to the States, that that would be farmed out or left to the towns where people came from. And there was a great hue and cry, and they had to restore funeral services on the base because people felt more attached to that base than they did to the hometowns from which they'd come. Now, we have examples in the 20th century of veterans' organizations or veterans' movements in other countries, fortunately. I think of the Fasci di Combattimento in Italy in the 1920s, uh, Hitler's original organization in Italy in the 1930s, which were built on the sense that veterans were a different part of the culture than the rest of the society. And God forbid that we should ever develop that kind of an attitude amongst our own military in this society. Another point on that first question was, I was at a conference last week in Washington about how scholars rank presidents. And it's not uh, 
in, beginning with the Schlesingers, who started to rank them. But for the last 50 years, the same presidents have been ranked the top presidents, great or near great. And every, almost every one of them was a wartime president. So that if you're concerned about your legacy, as most presidents end up being concerned, uh, it's better to be a wartime president than not if you want to be great, rated great or near great by scholars. It's a sad fact, uh, but true. Uh, presidents, except for Theodore Roosevelt, who are uh, uh, in office during times of peace and normality, uh, usually rank average or below average.